beach, as you can see, when you look, it's flat. Mm -hmm. You'll see I've taken a few videos from the pier at low tide. You can look both ways, and it looks like you could have a football field put on it. And that's from constant dredging every couple of years, and they just keep piling the sand on. When I was a kid, I remember fishing. I would just sit in my mom's chair with a little rod catching whitey. There are huge cuts all over the beach. And then they started all the dredging, and we haven't seen that in a while. So for Jack's Beach, I suggest you want to get here about three hours into the outdoor. Especially if you don't have a larger rod where you can actually reach over the wave. When that, that surf starts to go out, you'll start to see where the sandbar runs pretty much north and south on the beach. What you want to do and look for, I, I had pictures, I forgot them in my truck. You'll see the sandbar coming and you want to find an area where it looks like there's no whitewash because a lot of times there'll be a break in the sandbar. So the sandbar's coming, whitewash, no whitewash, and then it'll start again. That's where you want to fish because when the tide's going out, everything's funneling into that area. So if that's where all the bait is, where do you think the fish will be? Right? And the last few days when I'm cleaning all the, the body, they're full of little sand fleas, little clams. So you know they're feeding right on the sandbar, and on the high tide, they're sitting right overshoot the fish at high tide most of the time. If they're full of little shell and uh, sand fleas, that means they're right in the breakers, right behind it. And fishing on the pier really helped me to learn how to surf fish better because on the pier you get days where it's like four to five foot surf. Now you wouldn't fish that on the beach because you're looking it's too rough. On the pier you can move out past where the big surf is and literally every time no matter what the tide was, fish were always directly behind the surf. Drum, sheep fed, reds, trout, flounder, whiting, everything was always behind the surf line. You always want to get to where it sort of levels off in the current. And as the tide goes out, that trough, you'll be able to see that more, and then I'm going to throw in that trough until it's too low, you know? The reason, do you have short rods or big rods? That's, that's the main issue with fishing for surf fishing, like Jim knows. This is an 11 foot. I, I use a 10, 10, 11, and 12s. But I prefer the 11 and 12s. And it's not so much to say, look, I got, I can throw a mile. When you're fishing in surf like this, your line's out there. If you have a six, seven foot rod, what's gonna happen every time that wave breaks? Me. Your rod's going like this. Mm -hmm. And it, even with a Sputnik, these waves like today would probably help move that line a little bit more. So with these smaller rods, you're throwing out and you're staying up above the wave. When you set these reels the right way, you don't have to toss them off. It's gonna go. You let the rod, don't you, your arms aren't supposed to be what powers it, the rod is. That's where you get all your strength and your throw as a rod. So if you have spinning reels, you shouldn't get a backlash. But you need to get a casting cannon for, what's a casting cannon? For Chip, he has one. It goes on your uh, spinning rod, especially if you have braid on a spinning reel and you're trying to throw that thing hard. I've been to get what happens to your finger sometimes. Yeah. Like that. Right. So with that casting cannon, it, it just clips on there, right? Yeah, you can put it on. Can I talk about that? Yeah. yeah, I want you to. Yeah. Real quick, uh, great information. Uh, if you're using a spinner, a lot of times, a lot of the old salts will use the bait caster because they can cast it farther. Everybody hears you can cast it farther, you can cast it farther. Well, you can cast it farther for one reason. You bend the rod the correct direction. Yes. <laughs> so if you're spin throwing your spinner, if you're up here, that rod bends this way. Well, it's just like throwing air. You just shot it that way. Well, with the casting cannon, you can actually pull the rod and then throw the rod so you shoot it that way. Does that make sense? So the casting cannon just gives you the ability to put the bait where you want it, not that it's a miracle thing. But it just makes it a lot easier. Not in my pocket, but the, uh, the, the it, truck. It's attached to the spinning reel. So, so you just you just put it on underneath, right underneath the spinning reel, and what happens? You just wrap it around twice, uh, put a little uh, uh, zip tie on it, put two zip ties, one on the front, one back, and then wrap it because that zip tie will cut you. Okay. Yes. So just wrap it. But the big thing is, is what people look for is you all. Especially when a with big wind in your face, you just can't get it to the fish. And that casting cannon gives you the ability to shoot it. Larry's the 
the best at it. He can throw a sidearm, six foot off the ground, no wind, wind in his face, he can still throw 100 yards yeah. because he can throw a sidearm. And it doesn't, but if you have a spinner, that thing goes up in the air, the line all catches, and then, but it's just how you shoot your arrow. So that casting cannon gives you a little bit better. Because that, that braid, I use a lot of braid. When it cuts in your finger, it makes the rest of the day pretty bad. Because every time you reach and get a fish, that salt water gets in there. It does not. It makes you tentative when you're throwing. You don't want to throw it so hard. And last year when we were fishing, even even just the braid, when I was catching trout by the pier, sometimes they're hitting it so hard, you know, fingering it, I needed the gloves. That's something you should buy too, the braid gloves. I had several times where a trout hit it so hard it pulled the braid into my finger. And that, you're trying to fight a fish with blood pouring out of your finger, but but that's that's that. If you like spinners, you can use mono. For this one, I got 30 pound braid for boy, and underneath it, I just have 14 pound mono. I just tied together, and it uh, it holds. If you do the oh man, <laughs> <laughs> and the tide's going out too. But when you got swells like this, this is what happens. And the water still feels like it's probably about 61, 62. If, when you see bluefish showing up, then you know the pompano are going to be right behind. Did you get one? Because right now the bluefish are thick in Matanzas, so that's probably about a week away, a week and a half away, and we got a lot of south wind coming next week. So that south wind, even though it'll make the water dirty, and usually the fish in, you, what do I always say in the south wind? What does it do? It dirties up the water. And what, and what cut you up is brown turn around. What follows in the dirty water? Sharks and rays. Sand fish and rays. And sand perch. If y'all know what sand perch are, they are the fish. They're worse than sharks. Jim knows. You ever on the beach and all you're catching is sand perch, drill up and move spots. Do not stay in that spot. Because they're about that big and they will eat all your bait. They'll eat fish bites, plant. They'll eat everything you have. And there's nothing you can do with them unless you want a shark fish. Any questions before we go on? So how do you set up the clips and whatnot? What's that? Well, this is the rig that's really been working. Uh, I got to get the name of it. I learned it from a buddy from North Carolina. It's all one piece of line. All you have is one swivel on it. And so this orange float, if you don't have orange floats, you better get something chipped. As you can see, this was the orange float. See all the... That's where the whiting were absolutely destroying this float. See how it's all chipped up? I had to keep changing them because it's, it's becoming a white float. And then I got a little salmon bead on there. The bead is more so to keep this float because it has a pretty big ball right there. You don't want to get trapped on the foot. And then you just got a surgeon's knot about halfway down the line. Hold on, oh, there it is. So you don't even need a swivel. You just take that loop put it through your weight. And then you got your weight on it. To me, the less tackle, the better when I'm fishing. It saves you a lot of money too if you're breaking off rigs, the less hardware you're losing. And then it just comes down with a longer leader. And on the bottom rig, I typically just use a bead. Because with this rig, what I found out, if I had a float on it, it would get tangled. Well, that's a little different than the top one. Yeah, but I, so the last last two weeks, the dropper, these, this rig, I started this rig on Wednesday. A lot of success in this rig here. Just the dropper rig with the little uh, white beads. They caught, they're a little bit faded after the last two days, but uh, right here. And now Chip sells sells the Bruno rig, which has the orange, right? Yeah, it's orange and this, yellow. You will, this, this, orange and yellow are the colors right now in pink. If you have, if you're gonna buy any type of floats, orange, pink, and yellow at least, because especially when those pompano show up, they're a sucker for that pink and uh, yellow. When the pier is open, we throw pompano jigs for them with the butt tail. The yellow and pink was what they always hit on. The biggest pompano I caught was 21 inches on a. Uh, yellow pink bucktail. The picture is a pink bucktail. You throw it out there so when you're fishing that's what you want to use because you know they're in the jack family. And if you know about Jack the Bell you'll catch them all day on lures. So if it's in the same family they're gonna 
act the same way. They'll hit a gotcha too. We've caught them on gotchas before. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's talk real quick yeah. about uh, double drop versus. Uh, my brain's not working. On. I can't even. I can't breathe. breathe. <laughs> so let's talk just a little bit. So the double drop, and you can see here a lot, a lot of rip, the custom. If you're going to get some, make your own rigs. Or if you buy them at the tackle shop, most of them, the snoods are about this long. So that hook's right here. Well, Spencer just gave you the trick, right? Have a little longer snood, because your bait moves. And when the bait moves, it becomes attracted to fish. So you've got two options here uh, that a fish could, will eat, right? Now let's talk about that double dropper versus what Spencer has in his hand. He's still, he's still using the idea of a, of a double drop idea, but he's what we would consider a single drop. And a lot of, a lot of guys fish that single drop for Pompano. So this is, this is common. Uh, but what happens now? You have one that's floating. You have one that's doing its own thing. And Spencer puts that on the bar, and you'll see Spencer's rigs. He'll, he won't throw just this one. He'll throw this one right because this is doing its own thing this is the same idea of fishing with just a live shrimp carolina rig almost yep. yep so the benefit if you don't know you get the best to figure out which one it is and spencer has been doing this a while he knows which one's working and he'll change that straight out to what he wants if it's just working on the bottom or if it's working on the on the double drop he'll throw the double drop on them on there I don't fish a lot with Spencer, but I know that he's not an idiot. Right? So uh, he figured it out. He's going to keep hammering the fish because he knows what's working. So this is a great rig to figure out what the bite, what the fish are going to bite on. Okay, this double drop is standard, easy. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to. You cast it. You never have to worry about your bait getting hooked up in here. Okay, there. That, that is the main reason why this rig's not that popular but it is an amazing product now do we sell these online absolutely we do do they work in, in certain situations yes i don't i don't use them because i'm a surf caster and i want to use something that when i put my bait if, if i my goal is to put my bait there and this tide just rolls it down the beach 15 feet i'm not in the super highway anymore mm -hmm. so guess what you're having your bait out there now you catch fish and you go oh yeah i got Oh yeah, I know where they're at now. You put it back there and 15 minutes later it rolled over there and then you caught another fish. Well, you're wasting your 15 minutes every time. So put it in the super highway. So do these work? Absolutely. Are they cheaper? Absolutely. That's not what I use them. <laughs> right? Yep. Spark plugs work too. I ain't using those. I will not. I use, right? I use the Sputnik and the Storm Sinkers. But I only use this when the current's not too bad. If I can get away... I love chips weights, but I'm so used to using a storm sinker that if I don't need a sputnik, especially for the Carolina rig, it's mainly this rig I use this for, okay? All my double drops I use a sputnik. And if you don't know, this acts in two ways. One, it holds your, your bait in place, right? It also sets the hook for you. You don't have to do anything. If you already have circle hooks, one, you already don't set the hook. I, I have seen so many people using circle hooks and they still go like this. And they wonder why when they're reeling in the fish just comes off because it gets pulled out. So when that Sputnik's in there, the fish is hitting it. Guess what? He's pulling on that, so he's on. All you should be doing at that point is reeling in. That's it. And these are the owner hooks. I'm going to make a suggestion. That's what I have been using in the last few weeks. I've lost a lot of fish. If you notice how far, the owner hooks are very sharp. If you've ever used owner hooks, extremely sharp. So when these fish are barely hitting, what do you think is going to happen with a really sharp hook? Even though it gets in there, it's going to rip. Yeah. So the last two days, I don't know why I didn't use these before. After all these years of fishing, I switched to the Eagle Claw 1-0. 197. In two days, I never lost. The last two days, I did not lose a single fish. That's what I'll be switching to. And every single hook was right in the corner of the mouth. Eagle claw, one eye. One eye or two? One and two. One I got them. In, I got both in my bucket. Because when the sand fleas, when I start using sand fleas, don't you use them? I'll, I'll go up the next size up. But for clam and shrimp, this size is perfect. 
Oh, and this one? Yeah, I would not use a Sputnik with that one. It's when you're using the Carolina type rig, which is the slider, basically. These will hold, but it doesn't. The top line will tend to get wrapped up around here, so then you got a whole, whole serious issue. But like I showed in the video, when you're tying your rigs, when you're tying your hooks, make sure you don't leave any pieces of line hanging off. Because if you have a good leader, it won't be good for long. It's just in a caught that line's going to keep wrapping and wrapping them. And especially on a Carolina rig, if you have a tag, you're going to reel up and say, "Man, why is my line all twisted up?" And that that memory on that line. Especially if it's just mono leader, you're gonna to have to change leaders. It will not, it's just gonna keep knotting up regardless. It remembers that knot before, so you throw out and it'll just naturally twist back up. That's good. So if if you leave it. a big tail, it'll go like this. Yes, on it the does. Way in if you have a fish on or if you don't. So then later on. And that's another reason this is, uh, Spencer has, if you look at that, Spencer's presenting the bait. A little bit differently than if you smell it. Okay? Yes. The snow, this he's he's presenting the bait. He's not using the float. He's not making it look like a shrimp. He's he's naturally setting it up. Presentation. Let the bait hang. You see where it's going to hang? It's going to hang right down there, just like that. And present it so the fish will eat it. The other way is where where you go through the front. So then. It's presented like this and looks like and it'll present itself to look like a shrimp does that make sense yep. yeah. so that's there's different presentations this way is great if there's no weeds and that you're yes. fishing with shrimp if you need to if you got weeds <laughs> flip the hook around yeah flip it around now now you got that stuff doesn't catch on that okay. does that help anybody yep there's a lot a lot of good information there but Let's talk about that sputnik real quick. Has anybody been watching this rod over here? I can't keep my eye off of it. Yep. It's going like this. Well, do, 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 do. I can't tell if there's a fish on it or not. It just drives me crazy, crazy, but it is what it is. Yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> oh, definitely. Okay. As you can tell. No, it's not moving now, yeah. He, he went and put a sputnik on it, so it's not going like going like this. Right? You yeah. had to clarify it. Yeah, yeah, the anxiety I have when a rod's going like this and no one's got a hold of it. Right. Uh, but the thing, the one thing about the Sputnik, what is so important is this. That is the most important. Is because you don't yes. want to drag it in like this. You might as well use a pyramid. Okay? So you want to have the sinker that makes it where you pull it in, it just runs right up on the beach. Because you'll see. This isn't one of those beaches that are real bad. But where that break is right there, if you were casting over that, that pompano, if you pick, catch that pompano, he dives his nose right into that bank. Yep. And if, if you have a Sputnik, it'll, it's already like this. You just pull the Sputnik right up on over the top. Well, if you have a pyramid, that pyramid stops. That fish buried his nose, loose line. You just lost the biggest pompano Especially in your life. Especially the Beach, where the trough is yeah. much more pronounced than up here. It's deep bank and it's soft so those pyramids yeah. will actually sit you'll feel it like this for a minute and you, you lose got a lot of fish like that you got you got a 15 18 pound redfish and you came in with a six inch whiting so is yeah. that why you use a, a storm <laughs> instead of a regular pyramid why? yeah he, he, i use those when i'm fishing any type of carolina rig okay. the storms and the storm is created different it doesn't have that big sharp edges on all four of a pyramid right now we do still have them on online store and some people still use them and that's okay but i don't i want to bring my pompano in yeah there's no reason your your biggest fish best fish ever you lose on the beach because of a technical error of buying the putting the wrong sinker on that that's crazy to me so those weights actually look a little bit better than that. That one has had some wear and tear next yeah. to the pier. There's a couple when of fish I'm, on this When I'm like fishing next to the pilings, where I'm just right yeah. on the pilings, so it sort of deems a little bit. But you can see now, now we know that rod, it's, it's different, isn't it? So, he's set up, he's, a, he's, he's a you can fish that rod and know there's a fish on it. And with this, what I notice, how I get a lot of double ups, I usually fish three to four rods, and I have a different rig on each rod. And you'll learn real quick which 
color bead or float the fish are wanting that day. So once I find that out, I switch all the rods over to that particular color. I remember a few years ago in the uh, whiting tournament, it was me and two guys. Uh, we were all spread out on the beach. He had red beads, he had, the other guy had pink beads, I had green beads. I was the only one catching fish. Made a call, hey, switch to the green beads. They all started catching. Why they eating green beads that day, I have no idea. I'm not a fish, but I just know, give them a lot of options and see what they want for that day. It's like us, we like to eat the same thing every day. So like the last few days, the orange, that orange float, zeroing in, and I think it has a lot to do because the sand fleas are showing up now. And so when those whiting, that orange, if you've seen the big sand fleas, they always have eggs, the orange eggs. Well, that orange, and then you got that shrimp, I really believe they think it's a sand flea. And they've been having sand fleas all in their bellies right now. But what I was saying with the spudding, you see that first dip, you know, it's just wide and get a good picture of it. You don't have to hurry up and reel it in. I ain't been making mine so little different. For a few seconds, 20 seconds, a lot of times I'll have two fish on that. Because those fish are coming over that sandbar to school. So just because one fish is in it, don't mean you got to reel it in real fast. Those other fish are trying to figure out what he's doing, and they see that other bait. So that's how I double up a lot of times on the rig. I'll just let them hit a few extra seconds after the first hit. And it's worked well. Now with the storm sinker, you can't do that because that fish is automatically going to start moving. And then you get you get any slack in the surf, you're asking for trouble, especially with a braid top shot. You get a, if you use braid and you know what I'm talking about, you get a knot, you might as well cut it. It, it can ruin your day real fast. Or if there's a lot of seaweed, I just go ahead and leave for the day because the braid, it's too, one, it's too expensive to keep cutting it out. And the next thing, when you get globs of seaweed on it, it is a mess. And it doesn't just pull out like that. I mean, you gotta rip. And it's even worse on mono because braid will at least cut through the seaweed. Mono, that's why the other day when I took the video, there was all those sticks on the beach from all that northeast wind. Thankfully, it wasn't in the surf. It all blew up on the beach. But if there's seaweed, my advice is don't even fish that day. I went to Melbourne two years ago. We were going to catch some pompano. And we got there. The day before, they killed them. Patch of seaweed moved in. We fished 20 minutes the whole weekend. <laughs> we went to Sebastian and caught snow. Because when that seaweed comes in, it's like a carpet. You can see it on the waves. And you might get a clear window of like one or two hours, but then all of a sudden, here it comes. And you, Steve knows from fishing the pier. Remember in the fall when that seaweed was in there? Yeah. You would throw out and the rods like this, and then you just see the line go slack, and then you're really in it. I mean, 20 pounds of seaweed. It's like stingray. So we just ended up catching mm -hmm. sand fleas. It was better to catch sand fleas that day than try to even catch a fish. But, and I've noticed when there's a lot of seaweed guys, there's not a lot of fish in the water. They're there, but they're not. Whatever reason, when the pier was open, all I've fished the pier over 30 years since I was this. Anytime there's a ton of seaweed, we never caught fish. And I know the fish are there, but whatever it is, they just don't feed when that seaweed's in there. I, I, I just, I haven't figured that one out, so if someone does, let me know and we can post that up. But until then, we'll just assume that, watch out guys. Yo, I got shoes on. What would be another spot that you would pick? Here. Alright, I'm, I'm going to say something. There is always somewhere that doesn't have seaweed. Yeah. It might not be here. But there's somewhere there's no seaweed. So if this is the beach that you came to and your family wanted to fish, this is where you're going to fish. This is where you're going to enjoy. You're going to enjoy. You're not going to fish. But I shouldn't share this because it's one of the main <laughs> tricks, but I'm going to because everybody took their time out of their day. If we're, if we're got, if we've got that southeast wind blowing this way, the southeast, the water's running this way, Where's the where's all the weeds gonna be? Where, at that end? Probably at the inlet? Well this one should be clear if, at Hannah Park. Hannah Park should be clear if it's blowing this way because we have that jetty out. Right? It'll block, it'll it'll keep it out away from you. And it might be here, but it's not at Hannah Park, so it's not very far down the beach. But you have to just understand where those spots are. And I'm not going to tell you that Hannah Park, when the, when it's a, <laughs> it, that's not always true, okay? But if, if you gotta make a decision, that's where I would go, okay? So I'm not gonna tell you every beach that you go to where you need to go, but that, just think about that and that idea because 
With that being said, also, if this water's dirty here, it doesn't mean Hannah Park's not clean. Or Huguenot, yeah. Or Huguenot on the other side of the inlet. Okay? So there's always options if you only have the weekend to fish. So make sure that you're checking. Spencer put out that video. That is, watch it many times because it is the keys and the tricks to the trade of catching fish every time you go. Because once you know what the wind's doing, what, where you're going, and then you go, I know there's fish there, but it's gonna be weedy, it's gonna be bad. I'm gonna make a new choice when I wake up and then go catch fish. And, that, and that's what makes the good ones good is you can adapt at that change. Sometimes you have to have the feeling to say, oh, Jack's Beach is the place today. But you don't have that, that ability to make those decisions. It's all on education. So watch that video Spencer put out. That took a lot of time, lots of effort went into that. Lots of many, many, many people catching fish on the pier yeah. uh, to put out that information. So just watch that and that'll help you become a better fisherman. Yeah. I just had, I forgot what I was going to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you ever had that? Well, I was going to say for a general rule of thumb in this area, the beach is so flat. And even on the beach rough, you can always figure the last three hours out going, first three hours of incoming. That's usually your prime target area. <clears throat> now, if you got longer rods, in Ponte Vedra, the high tide won't matter. You'll still be able to reach where you need to reach. But right now, where I'm fishing down there, in front of a customer's house, it, it slopes down and then it comes into a, like this, right in here. This, see how it's a little deep right here? Yep. I mean, it's just an indentation, I call it. It's just a small indentation. For the most part, you're not going to catch fish in that even in high tide because it's so shallow. You got to remember, like I was saying, I don't see any right now, but in Ponte Vedra yesterday, there were about 10 osprey, ospreys flying all over the place. They're constantly diving and picking up whiting. So if I'm a whiting, I don't want to be in shallow. I want to be a little bit deeper where that bird's not going to hit me. But down there, so you got the little trough, and then it's a sandbar, and then it's a deep trough. So at high tide, you can still catch fish in that deep trough because the sand fleas are still there. Speaking of sand fleas, if you don't know what you're looking for, look for areas like this where there's a little drop. Because as that tide comes out, all the sand fleas that have made it in shallow, before the tide gets too low, they congregate on the edge of these little drop-offs. And then they'll move out. Last fall, next to the pier, and there was a trough, he knows, Matt knows, there's a probably a 20 foot trough about that deep and the sand fleas they were just stacked by the thousands all along that edge oh well, you can see you didn't even have to look for them you just knew to go and scoop right. and another thing when you see the there's one down there can you see him in the water down there that sandpiper right before all those kids playing that guy right there yeah. he's the best sand flea finder so wherever you see him feeding you might want to check and see if there's some sand fleas around because last week at the pier there are three of them and i didn't even know the sand fleas were up in that area, and I saw all three of them run up to the beach with a sand flea. I'm like, well, I'll be darned. Huh. Then I was, went out in the water a little bit, and as the wave was coming down, there were sand fleas everywhere. They're really big right now, though. These are the guys that are coming back up from, they don't migrate. The sand fleas do not migrate. There's sand fleas past North Carolina, so if you think all those sand fleas make it all the way down, they're not going to Miami for a vacation, so they just dig down deeper. I mean, it's true. I always thought, how do they migrate that far down like they don't? Because if you take a shovel in Ponte Vedra in the middle of winter, you can dig and find them. But the thing is, in the winter, they're not really eating those sand fleas. They're zeroed on on a shrimp. In the video in like January I put in Ponte Vedra, there were shrimp boats all over the beach, right off the beach. And the Whitey and I were catching them full of shrimp. And I said, so that's another sign. Wherever you see shrimp boats along the beach, there's a good chance there's gonna be Whitey in that area too. Cause Believe it or not, the shrimp are right off. They're right off the beach. Nobody just goes out and casts that. Some, but when the pier is open, we can see them on the pilings sometimes, the big shrimp. So when they make their way out the river, they're just cru cruising down the beach. And those whiting, because I've always caught whiting and said, how the heck does this whiting have a shrimp, a whole shrimp in their belly? Because it wasn't my shrimp. Because he's getting hooked or something on my hook, you know. But Matt cleaned the whiting the other day. It had, what, how many pieces of shrimp in it? That little joker took eight pieces of my shrimp. And hell, I even caught one. And he had two hooks. He, he ate my high and my low rig. 
I reeled him in, and my cousin looked at it, he couldn't believe it. Yep, so shrimp boats fishing that area because you know there's a lot of shrimp. The little edges like this, right where some of these fish you can see how deep they're right. Then when the water gets warmer, believe it or not, first thing in the morning, redfish and trout will sit in this shallow water at high tide. They'll sit right there. So you want to get out here first thing in the morning before there's a lot of beach activity. There's been a lot of times where I got out first thing in the morning to catch mullet, and I'm walking in the trough like this, and I see a red goat. And I, you know, fisherman's instinct is to try to throw a net, and I've never caught one because they are just really fast. I, I can't help myself. I'm like a kid in the candy store. I'm like, let me see if I can get this red. But they'll sit right in there first thing in the morning. And then as the sun comes up, of course, you need to move deeper. You know, the pier, it really helps when you fish off a pier to learn to surf more because you can actually see where the fish, the depth they're hanging. When the pier's open, the trout are usually first thing in the morning. Deep, deep, deep or less, they'll just be lined up in the surf. By nine o'clock, they're out deeper. They don't like that sun. They don't like what, what can eat them from above. Same with the whiting. We've seen schools of whiting. And what's weird, we always thought of schools of whiting like 30, 40 fish. Every school I've ever seen coming through would be like seven, eight fish. That's it. So I think when you're on the sandbar, that's what's happening as that tide comes in. All those fish that went over the sandbar on the really low tide, they're coming back in schools, seven or eight. That's why for anybody who's been fishing the last few days, three rods, you can go five minutes with no bites. Then that rod will go off. And so you're reeling that, then the next two go off. You're like, hey, man, can't you give me a little break? Because your arm starts to kill you a little bit. If you're just, and then you'll throw it out, and it might do the same thing, five minutes. And then you just get to know, okay, well, here comes the school. Here they come again. Same with the pompano, which will be coming soon. It's your Go ahead. Let's talk about uh, on this beach at this time. This rod holder is, is in a pretty good spot. When... The pompano, when the water is clear, if you go look, this water is pretty clear. You can see through it. You'll be able to see a pompano yeah. running through there. Uh, but once you, if you can see fish, they can see you. They can see you. Yes. <laughs> so if you're going to go put your sand spike out there, you don't have a chance to catch a fish in this first trough. Right. And those red fish, they're coming through. Biggest red fish, 47 yeah. inches at 10 yards. But I was on top of the bunch of dune casting over. I wasn't standing. I didn't put my sand spike in the in the, uh, in the the wash. And the other thing is, if you spend money on your gear, just invest it with a better sand spike. That's true. The I, sand spike, that has made the difference. It's so I've good. seen so many people drop their reels and rods in the water. Just save your money by just buy a good sand spike. There's a guy, Brian Curlett makes these. Curlett. They're awesome. What's his name? Brian Curlett. And, but, uh, they're, they're, it, it saves your gear. I I don't know how many spin fishers I pulled and picked up, had to wash off. And if you do drop one for some reason, wash it off immediately. Quit fishing it, take it home, put it in the bathtub. Let it just light flush it out. Especially the further south you go. Yeah, it's a lot softer. So I last year I don't know how many times I saw people, not even a fish, big surf. You can see it happening. That sand spike starts to lean a little bit, and they're not paying attention. Next thing you know, boom. And then they keep using it. So one, like you said, if it drops, don't use it anymore. You need to go home immediately, take it apart, and don't just spray it off gent the gentle waters. Because what I learned a long time ago, like even cleaning my rods off reels from fishing, I just turned the water on, no nozzle, and just let it run smoothly over. If you're using any type of pressure, if there's sand, what do you think is going to happen? Where is that going to get pushed? Deeper. It gets pushed right into it. That's what I got told about 30 years ago when I first started. And, and you know, when you're young, you don't really take, you don't really care about the gear as much because you're not spending the, your parents buy the gear. It's not as meaningful as when it's your money. You're like, okay, I don't want to let this go, go to waste. And those sand spikes, these guys, man, they're awesome. A couple of pushes in, especially in that coquina sand in uh, Ponte Vedra. If you have a PVC sand spike, a lot of times it tends to pop up because of the water pressure. Yeah. Look, you don't need a mallet. You don't have to have a mallet. North and south. And the soft, closer to the water you get, the faster it goes in. I always like when I have to hear somebody going, katum. Yeah. Uh -huh. Katum. No you're wasting it. time. You're on the beach. Start fishing. 
The more people in the water, the less fish. You got sunscreen. What? You know what happens in the water. All of that stuff, those fish smell it. That's not natural to them. They get out of there. That's why when I'm fishing, I wear these long sleeve shirts because I hate sunscreen. I hate it. I know, and I, I, I'll have this, I'll have a buff on. All you can see is my glasses. So a lot of people don't even know it's me on the beach until they start talking to me because all they see is the Terminator glasses. So that, set, that sunscreen, what do you think's happening when you're putting, putting your bait on? You think they smell that? When they, the catfish don't mind it, but uh, the wadi certainly do. And the Diet Pepsi, I don't know how many of you have tried it. I've been using that for over 30 years. The last two days, that's all I've been, all winter, I use the Diet Pepsi. And it's the only reason I do it is when the water's cold. Because I think the fish, you know, like I have a fish, a fish pond outside with mud minnows. When it's cold, they don't really want to eat. But if I put a shrimp in there and smash it up, all of a sudden they're hungry. Well, that Diet Pepsi acts as some type of flavor. And I was taught this when I was like 12 years old. And I was like, come on, that's, that's not real, is it? Well, he was the only one catching fish out of 30 people on the pier. So I started doing it. I said, okay. i never questioned it since. But I'll, like I said, I only do it when the water's cold because those fish are a lot less aggressive. Can you hear that? Only when the water's cold. Yep. I didn't put it in my video. Spencer didn't tell it anybody else. You've got the information here. If it's hot water, they're not eating it. It needs you don't to be need fresh. It. You don't need it. Yeah, you need to have that fresh shrimp. So, we're going to but that's that's a little information is when the fish aren't biting, when they're when they're soft bite, they'll hammer that Diet Pepsi shrimp. And that gives the bite, yeah. it gives you the ability to catch more fish because of just knowing one more thing. So you're, when you buy live shrimp, you try to know you like this. So, yeah. uh, how long do you soak them in the Diet Pepsi? Me personally, I get them, I put them in my bucket, pour it in there, and I'm headed to the beach. Okay. I'll, I'll just put it this way. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had fish bites. I ran out of shrimp because they're biting so fast, so I had fish bites. This was in the water, it was 57 degrees still. Put fish bites out there, not a hit. So I said, well, let me try some. He knows, I put a, a strip of fish bites in the Diet Pepsi for about 10 minutes, took it out, cut it up, threw it out there. Boom, boom, boom. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. But just to show you, you gotta be careful about how long you soak it, because this Diet Pepsi, you know how fish bites will hold up a long time? Well, when you soak it in Diet Pepsi, it really becomes soft and it disintegrates fast. So think about what it's doing to the shrimp. Now you can, I've soaked them overnight, but I don't, I'll drain it off the next morning because by then they've already absorbed it all. I mean, that's just me. Everybody has their own way of soaking it. But as long as you get it on there at least 20, 30 minutes before, it works fast. I mean, the fish bites, soaking it, I said, I can't believe this. That's why I told uh, Brett, he works for fish bites, I said, do y'all have a Diet Pepsi flavor? He's, you know, it can't do that. But. <laughs> but once that water warms, you don't need to die pepsi because there's so much, one, they're not dormant anymore, they're not just sitting around. A lot of people don't know it, you can catch fish in Ponte Vedra all winter long. Just most people, when it gets cold, you know, when it's 40 degrees outside with a wind chill, you don't really want to be out there. But the fish are still there, they're just cruising along. So, is there any advantage to peeling the shrimp? What I do when I bite a live shrimp, I pop the head off. Leave those legs. Now, depending on how big the shrimp are, if they're medium size, I will usually get three baits. You gotta, you know, with that size. So if you don't need a, you don't need a monster piece of bait. These are whitey, man. They got, he knows they got small mouths. And if you see the size of the sand fleas they're eating, remember elephants eat peanuts, right? So I can make three pieces, and if I don't, don't peel them all the way, I'll at least peel one piece. Like with the live shrimp, they're much more firmer, so you can peel one strip off and put it on. Now, if we're getting the local shrimp, I call it the gray shrimp, I'll peel those because they, one, their shell's not as hard as, right now they got West Coast shrimp in it on the bait shops. They're very firm, so I just peel one piece. The, the local shrimp, when we get those, if you've seen them, they're already soft with the really shell. Soft. So I just take the shell right off, and you can cut those in real small pieces. If, if preference-wise, I would rather have the local shrimp. They absolutely destroy the local shrimp. It's not even a, it's not even a trout too, but we're fishing for trout. You get those local shrimp with those long antennas, my goodness, it's a whole, they know, these fish know what's native to here versus what's on the panhandle of Florida. If you're going somewhere else to go fishing, take your shrimp from here. Uh, if you're going to panhandle fishing, take your shrimp from here. We have the best shrimp yep. in Jacksonville area 
you can get shrimp, good shrimp, all the time. You go over the Panhandle, you got to go to Publix and get shrimp. Yeah. And that, and it might work, but I wouldn't pay nine dollars a pound for it. But I don't, I don't peel. I, I tell Spencer, Spencer peels at one shrimp. I don't peel them because I want to have one through one side hard, one through the other side hard for a little bit. If you're casting farther. Uh, I don't usually fish this first crop unless I'm trying to catch redfish. I always have one there, but that's not my goal. My goal is to have it on the back side of the bar that's 90 yards out right now. Uh, looking at that 18, 19 inch pop and I'm coming through. Okay, those big whiting. Uh, because that's where they're trying to hide. So I don't peel my shrimp, just it's preference. Just like Eddie, Eddie, he salts the shrimp. You couldn't get me to put a salted shrimp on my hook. But that's, it's, we have the best shrimp in this area. Now, if you're down somewhere else and you can't get shrimp, yeah, you better spice it up and do something with it. But we, we are lucky here. Further south you go, the better, the worse the selection gets. When we're at Sebastian, you might as well bring your own shrimp because if you don't get there by the first thing, when the bait shop's open, first thing, they're gone. Because everybody's trying to get those big snook on the big shrimp. And if you want dead bait, it's usually that pink. Uh, Key shrimp. That's not even native to around here, you know what I mean? So stay away from that. I just saw about five dolphins come yep. up. Yeah. I was going to say, if you're fishing on the beach and you see tons of that, you better find a new spot. I know. Because about three weeks ago, there we go. There they are. See? <laughs> that means it's about to start going down. So, wherever you see, that's another sign. Wherever you see pelicans diving, that's usually not an indication of where the whiting will be. but about two weeks when the water warms up, bluefish, Spanish mackerel, uh, trout, because you get a lot of little glass minnows and greenies start showing up along the beach. Those pelicans aren't diving for no reason. They got very good eyesight. Has he not yeah. just given you giving you the hole? Right. Giving the hole. We can see the hole. He just gave it to us. He circled that thing three times now. Yep. That's the hole. See it? The birds will tell you. What other, any other quick questions? Nothing's a quick question, I guess. Are you going to store your like, shrimp for a long period of time? Like, you know, you don't have time to go out and make stores all the time. What's the best way to preserve your shrimp, say, even if you're going to go to South Florida and Dead fish shrimp. out there? You want them dead? Yeah. Or just, just, just what your preference would be if you were to go on a long trip or What I've done before is in the fall, you know, they're they get massive amounts of shrimp in the river here. And the more shrimp they get, the lower the price drives drives down. So what I've actually done in the past is I'll call Larry at Atlantic Coast Seafood. I've gotten 50 pound boxes. And it's, the more you buy, the better the prices. And these are shrimp right off the boat. I freeze them whole, but I use uh, spring water to freeze them. Do not ever use tap water to freeze your fish in or your bait because you got tons of chlorine. What do you think that chlorine does to that bait? Yeah, I use Zephyr, I go to the uh, store and buy the cheapest spring water, fill it up. That way, one, the shrimp don't get freezer burned, and when they fall out, they're still nice and moist. Okay. And the fish, they'll, they'll eat them up. I, st I normally um, dry mine off in food saver. That works, uh, yes. Uh, cut the tails, cut the heads off, and a lot of times I'll just cut them, prepare them, and uh, like a little half pound block, Put them in, stack them in the fridge, so I can take a half a pound with me. Uh, and that, that's how I do. Either a food saver or a block of ice, something like that. Even like little Ziploc, those can twist containers. Okay. Because if you, if, like, if you use like water like I do, those are a lot easier to put water in than just. Yeah. The only bad thing is if you only bring one and the fish are slamming, you're like, oh man, I gotta rub that. <laughs> I've done, and that's why with like my sand fleas, I think it was Noel who did uh, the slush. Was it the slush? Where you freeze your set, they don't quite freeze, and I still have them in my freezer, and I can still pull them out as I need them. Use a ton of uh, sea salt and water. You, have you used it? Yeah, and it preserves the sand fleas. And I use uh, Ziploc containers, fill it up with sand fleas, pour it in there, and that way, if you're going and you only bring like 15 or 20 sand fleas, you're not taking a whole container and then wasting the rest. Because right now, you know how fast stuff it's gonna it's gonna melt fast, and then I never refreeze bait again. If I unthaw it, it 
doesn't go home with me, it goes to the birds or it goes back in the water. That's great. You keep refreezing it, that, that shrimp's not going to be any good. It's going to start to turn orange. It'll turn turn orange in the uh, freezer. Another good Unless you put Diet Pepsi yeah. on. That's right. Diet Pepsi, no problem. It'll ferment it? It will, yeah. If you're freezing a lot of bait in the uh, freezer, keep in mind, do layers at a time. What I learned when I worked at the old pier in the bait shop, we would get in 500 pounds of shrimp at a time, and I was the fortunate one who got to bag all of that up in half pound bags. We would put about two layers and then wait two hours, because if you stack up too much bait at a time in your freezer, those middle packs, they're not gonna freeze quite as fast, and those shrimp will already, they'll actually start to go bad before they actually get frozen. So you go go out to the beach and unthaw them, and you're like, why are they, why are they already orange and black? Yeah. Did you have a question? What's the average distance between spots? So if uh, you have a spot here, but there's someone here, how far do you typically walk before you? Uh... Well, the first thing I do when I come over the sand dune, I, that's where I'd be right now. See down to the north? See that sandbar right there? Yep. Cute, that huge strip of whitewash. So that, that sandbar is going like this, east to west. We know it doesn't keep going east to west. So use, I call it the elbow sandbar. They come around. Elbow back and then go straight back down. That's how I've been catching most of my fish, going in that little, the elbow of it, I call it. On dead low tide, and those elbows are still pretty deep. So you can still pick fish in that area, and as the tide comes in, I throw on the sandbar as it's coming in. Because those fish, like I said, it's like an invasion force, they start coming back over that sandbar until about three hours into the income, they'll sit on that sandbar. After it gets higher, they're moving in a little bit shallower. Yesterday, before I left, I started throwing only 20, 20 yards out, boom, 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 and then I packed up and left. So I'm like, well, if somebody was still down there, they'd have been catching. The guy to the south of me had two whiting. He'd been there all day. So is that the same case right there? Right, right here. Is that the same case that you see? Now that's a run out right here. See where that surfer is? Right here. See how that water? It's like a little. Looks like almost like a mushroom cloud. Now that's a, that that run out's really close, and what it's caused by is this little trough. This trough goes out, all that water funnels out. So if the difference is now, yeah. What's the, what's the big difference? Now? That's the sandbar. That's just going to be where the wind is. It comes up shallow and it comes around an in a, in a elbow. So those fish will sit right in that elbow. A run out, those come and go. When that tide gets completely low, that run out will probably be gone because this trough here is going to be empty. There's nothing else to force it out. So if you can't get to that sandbar at the high tide, fish this run out. Because those fish, now, when you're throwing in the run out, that's why these the longer rods come in handy. Because if you have a seven foot rod and you're throwing right on the edge where it starts, one, you're going to get your bait. The current will actually rip the bait off the hook because it's so strong in there. I always throw to the left or the right of a run out. Because if you watch, I've seen some on Google, if you don't have Google Earth Map, it's great. I've found runouts all over. Now, I don't know when they're dated, but it just, for, for looking at it, how it would look from above. These runouts come out and they look like a plume, like a mushroom cloud. Those fish are on the left and the right side where it's sort of puffing out because all that bait's getting filtered out to that runout. And it's like a, feed, a smorgasbord for these fish. The sand fleas that aren't smart enough to dig back in, they're getting stuck sucked out there and those fish are just waiting. Uh, Wednesday I fished the run out. I didn't fish the sandbar. I only had I could only fish in the morning. I had 33 whiting in an hour and a half fishing a run out. They were I had to go to one rod because as soon as I throw it out, they're hitting it as soon as they hit the bottom. Uh, it is insane. You heard what he said. I fished the run out. There's another place if you don't if you can't find a run out it's the sandbar isn't it? or what I call the super highways yes. of the world. Fish run just like we do. Okay? The Mother Nature just has where they're gonna go. So, how, how can you tell where the sandbar, where the run out is? You're looking at these waves, and we're kind of bad timing right now, but you're looking where that young man is down there, where those surfers are. See those two waves? The one's gonna stop. You see it just stop? It was shoulda broke. You'll see it, it should break. It's not gonna break. Right in the middle of that one, it broke. There's the run out, it just gave it to you. So watch this surfer, he's gonna run right into that run out. smooth area, it creates a smooth area on the surface. Yep. Yeah. 
So you can find out by the waves breaking on one side or the other and where it didn't break in the middle, that's your run out. Fish, fish it. Fish on the back side of it, fish to the left of it, fish to the right of it. You put it in the middle, the season right now is we're gonna have redfish and black drum and put put a bait in there. Put a piece of shrimp you in You better there. have a spot anchor out your weight will never hit the bottom. Yeah. I'm serious, those more people drown in runouts than anything else on the beach because they try to swim against it. You, I, I will not throw a storm sinker in a run out. It'll never hit the bottom. The rod will just stay bent over like this because and it'll go like this where the weight is actually being pulled by the current. This right here will stay. So make sure that those fish are coming into those holes and they're gonna come and make a run around. The other day I said, okay, I'm gonna put this. I had a guy from the East Coast come in. I said, okay, I'm gonna catch my black drum now. He goes, how do you know that? And I just <laughs> said, it's right there, boom. 45 seconds, black drum reeled at the end. Oh, look at that, he was amazed. But it was time for that fish to come in. Yes. Into that yeah. run out, come circle around, yeah, go on now. Not, not everything does that. But Those two guys in the water have no idea. In the server, that's the run out right there. Right where those two boys are. They the have worst place no idea they're in the run out right now. Worst place to swim. It's where two, the two troughs are coming together. <coughs> and you can see where the right where that surfer is with the blue board. Surfers constantly use the run outs. Guess what? They don't even have to paddle. They just get in it and it takes them right out. When the pier's there, there's always a run out that runs by the pier. That's why I was wanting to meet there because it's very, you can really see it. But we don't need to be charged for parking from where we live. You know that's saying? another story, yeah. But those runouts, that's what the surfers always use. They just, they don't even have to paddle, it shoots them out. So right there, I would fish that. And, and another thing, if you don't get any bites, with whiting, what I noticed, if you don't have a bite within 10 or 12 minutes, go ahead and reel up and go to another run out. That, because just like us, we don't all congregate at the same restaurant at the same time. So where one run out may not have fish, you move 100 yards to the south, that run out may be loaded. That's just how it is, they're schooling fish. Same with the trout along the beach. Uh, a couple years ago, we were catching the trout down this area and there's a huge slough. Another slough. Well, they're only hitting in one slough. Everybody, I mean, you, as a fisherman, you got to try each slough when you come to that one. Like they were talking on the radio show this morning, never leave the fish biting. If you find a good spot where they're biting, stay there. Don't think, oh, well, I could probably do twice that much down in that area. And another thing, gut instinct. Once you learn to read the beach like we've been showing, don't ever second guess yourself. About three weeks ago, I saw two different runouts. And the one was smaller and the one was bigger. And I was like, the bigger one was further. And I was like, I'll try this small one. When I was getting a few fish, I was like, okay, let me go to the big one. I was like, why didn't I go there first? Because it was, it was like 50 fish in an hour, two hours, something. That was every cast. And I'm just like, man, if I'd have just listened to my gut instinct, keeps you from wasting money from spending on bait and stuff. You go right. out, you'll spend money on three dozen shrimp, and you only use a dozen and a half, and the rest go back to the ocean. Yeah. You know what you do. Like I said, if, when you're fishing, you gotta move. Don't stay where the sand is and then you can catch them. Yeah. 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 Don't stay where the sand perch are. Same thing, sometimes you get into a school just small pompano. Move, because that might be only small pompano in that area. But, like if I was coming down today, that sand, I mean, it is a pronounced sandbar. Oh man, I like that sandbar. Yeah, right in there. Right in there. When I'm when I'm looking at it on the beach, I want that sandbar. That sandbar right there, directly in front of me. And I'm throwing to the right of right in that. If we went down there right now, there'd be fish right now. So that sandbar is showing you what? Shallow water, right? So they're super highway. If they're not eating on top of it, they're going to be running around it. So. The big, the big whiting that I was catching this week were on the front side of that sandbar. Uh, I went some, some were on top of the sandbar. If I missed my cast by five yards, but I'm trying to put it on the sandbar, or on the front, or the back side. Well, you can't get. If you can get to the back side of this, we're going to get you a new contract with the rod company. <laughs> but if you can get to the front of that, there's that super highway. Those pompano will be running through those. The redfish will be running through there. So think about when you have luck. Remember where you were casting, because that's, yes. if you don't know where you cast, if you can only fish two rods and remember where two rods go, just fish two rods. Because you need to know where three rods or four rods are exactly the same, so when you cast it, it's the exact same spot. If you struggle with casting, I'll put some stuff up. 
Noel Coon's a really good uh, teacher of casting, okay? But just stand here, come out here in the middle of, middle of the day when no one's here, when it's 100, no one will be here. And just cast down the beach and try to hit a bucket. Just just cast it, put, put a, a, a cheap sinker on there, put a bank sinker on there, and just cast it and try to hit the bucket. Get your skills better that, because we don't work on those, right? We come to the beach and we just sling it as hard as we can. It's not about that, it's about throwing it where it needs to go. That's so, right. I, thank you. Who was I talking to? Uh, somebody the other day about telling them bait placement is the most important thing when you're fishing from the beach, right? If you're throwing your bait to 100 yards out and there's no fish there, what are you going to catch? If there's no, if there's no, you're not going to a restaurant at a hot bar and there's no food, how are you going to eat if there's no food there? So you want to throw where the fish are. So pretty much Jack's Beach, if you fish in this area, you want to fish the outgoing, first couple hours incoming. If we had more cuts in the beach, I would suggest high tide, and that may come, you know how the tropical storms come. We'll get some new cuts for them, and those usually hold a lot of fish. Ponte Vedra, you can catch them on both tides, as long as you have the right gear. If you have, if you can't cast far, and that's not an issue, go on the lower tide in the first couple hours of incoming, and fish the sandbar that's closest to the beach and in the trough. Because I always try the sandbar, run out, trough. A couple months ago, everything was in the trough, nothing on the sandbar. Now everything's on the sandbar, and that's what the new. What, what me and Matt found out is on negative low tides and full moon tides, because they do go out much, much lower. That sandbar's going to hold a lot of fish as it comes in. But the thing is, on the outgoing tide, they are high tailing it out. I mean, they're really going out here on a regular, regular tide phase. I was catching the whiting in the trough all day long. It didn't low tide. It didn't matter because it was still deep enough. Negative low, full moon lows. It's too shallow. So fish it, and then once you stop getting, if you go 20 minutes without a bite, it's safe to say you still may pick up one, but if you have time, go ahead and back it up and just come back later. I did that uh, about four weeks ago. I, I went on a negative low, and I know I shouldn't have, so I fished 10 minutes, caught one fish, and I just left my stuff at my customer's house and said, I'll be back. Came back two hours into the incoming, and it was just every cast on that sandbar. What do you personally look for? look at like app wise for tides and moon man i use i use i wind surf for my winds not because the, the, the their predictions aren't always right but i can actually look at up and down the coast what the actual winds are right. and like i said if they're calling for northeast of 10 have you ever seen where they call northeast 10 or 15 and it's actually that it's usually right. over the weekend it was supposed to be northeast at 15 to 20. it's going 28 miles an hour at the st augustine pier northeast at 28. So if you're, you can fish in 15 with his Sputniks, I've fished in 15 and 20. But if it's 28, you better go to Guan or go on the river somewhere. Let's talk about that real quick. We got a, we got a wind blowing. At any time when, when, you're, when you're fishing, when you're, you want to cast, you don't want, you don't want to cast where the wind's slapping over the top. So if the wind's blowing this way, we want to cast this way because the waves are going to come slapping on top of your line, right? So you want to cast this way. Now, that is not proper beach <laughs> etiquette, okay? So if I, my, fish on, get it. If I'm here, if I'm right here and we're blowing 15 to 20, I'm casting in front of him. Because when that, when that fish comes in, he comes right in here with the the current's going to push him down here, and he's going to pull in. If not, he runs across your lines, now you're up and over. Yep. That's another tip. Always go tip to tip with your rods to make it easy so they don't tangle up. I see so many people like pull their line down, yeah. grab it, just go tip to tip, it'll be easier. And I'll just show you one casting. If you don't do this, this will. this is the number one, the number one determiner if you're going to be a better caster is your left arm. When everybody has a, a left arm and most of them go like this. <laughs> well, the rod has to bend. This is the spot where it bends. And then everybody's got this little weak arm where the rod, does, it unbends because your arm's not strong. When you, when you go to cast, have this thing strong and then bend over the top. Does that make sense? Everybody, if you're throwing a spinner, has this little weak, little soft left arm. If you're right-handed, I don't know why we think that we need a soft arm, but 
just I can't I I coach people how to throw things far. And this is the end. And then this is goes this way. It doesn't go this way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Physics, put it out there. So when you're here, go ahead, push this out there in front of you, and then go over the top of it. Now, do you have to pull it back a little bit? Yes. Is it this? No. <laughs> Strong left arm, boom. Right at it. Mine are extended when I, yep. but of course I, I, I do things different because I am ambidextrous. So I, I, I should be throwing on his side. When you're real right handed, you're supposed to, but this is the side I'm throwing it, that's like that. Just like you said, like that, my arm's always like that. Yeah. And if you do it right, like he said, you don't have to throw it hard. Too many people think I've got to throw this as hard as I can. And that's where your most pop-offs come, right? Everybody, have you ever had those cash like, I'm gonna get it way out there now, and then, whoo! Another thing, every time I go to cast, always check your tip. Always check it, always make sure the line is off yeah, the tip. Because if it's wrapped, one, you're either gonna pop off, or you might pop off the end of your tip. And then your that whole day's ruined for that rod. Yeah, make sure your bell's Eighty percent of rods are built. <laughs> are built. <laughs> it happens. Where Carlos it will run a tip. You'll reel wrap the tip. Eighty percent of rods. It's because you're going to cast it. It'll because how it's set up, straight and back. It's going to wrap the tip. It's just how it works. So always check the tip. Any other questions? Oh, it's Did we help anybody out? Yeah, Is there yeah, anything yeah. I need to answer that we didn't go? Over? What will cause the spot to change? Like, is it a storm or? Just the normal day-to-day -day winds. Day-to-day -day you'll see change? Uh, okay, like if we get a west wind. See, he's throwing close to the sandbar now. The sandbar is just to the left of him. He threw on the right side of him. So that's where the fish are sitting. West wind tends to flatten out the beach even more. And it'll actually shift the sand and shallow. But northeast, southeast, a cut that would be right here today, if it's northeast at 15, down there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The only the only spot it never changes is that pier. And if you that that's the perfect example. I mean, parking's horrendous down there. But on the pier on both sides, it's just so deep that when the waves come in, they just completely disappear. And that's a nat it, it causes a natural slough in there. But we find those up and down the beach by scouting. You'll see areas where the waves are coming and they just completely disappear. That's where it's deep. That's where the fish are a lot of times. Especially as we get into the warmer months, those fish like to chill out where it might be a little bit cooler in that deep water. And on uh, Google Maps, you can look, running all the way down Ponte Vedra, you can see the deep water and then the sandbar then where it drops again. So it's pretty cool if you don't have that. Go on that and you can actually find areas because for the most part, that trough down there stays fairly consistent. The only thing that changes is in shallow where the sand shifts more. And uh, so if I'm looking good, that's another sandbar right, right there. there. Yep. 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 So like I said, my try run out sandbars and uh, the troughs. That's why I bring three or four rods, because you want to be able to try different areas. I'll put one on the sandbar, one in the trough, and then one if there's a run out close. Well, whichever hole's getting the most hits, where should I throw? Yeah, the, that's where they all are. Yeah. All right, so you can see the sandbar here. Yep. That's a, but you can see the suck on this side that's of it. Run out. That's yep. a run out. Big time run out. Okay? Now that's a that's a false. We we thought that's that we thought it was a tan bar, but what is it really? It's yeah. a run out. Across look the at, mushroom. Look yeah. at that yeah, big so mushroom. Like mushroom Find out yeah. where those are gonna just put your bait all around in that mushroom. Sometimes on the back side, on the left side, on the right side. That mushroom just told you we are stirred up a lot of stuff look and where the fish at. and the fish will be coming into that area. I mean, this is just a prime example of, of learning right now exactly where you can go fill your cooler by just going to any beach. Because yep. you, can, you can now do it by just knowing what to, to look for. Yep. Now, they're gonna and right right, right here is another run out. He's right on it. You can see it's going gonna, it's gonna to suck out. You'll see the run out there. But it will come and go. Yeah. They come. In Ponte Vedra, a lot of times, those run outs aren't permanent. They'll pop up for maybe 20 minutes. And if it's near me, I'll walk down and throw it because like clockwork, there's fish in it. The minute it dries up, I go back to throwing back where I was. And the pompano, when they get here, they will sit on the end of that run out too. Yeah. And big schools, I mean, they're just filling their bellies with sand fleas and everything else. That want. Little calico crabs, they love the whiting and the pompano. You'll clean them and they'll usually be filled with calico crabs. 
All right, what's what's the best place to fish? Right there, or right there. What's the best place to fish? Right there, or right there. But we didn't see it until right now. Tide's going out. Right. Pick your stuff up and beat the next person there. You wouldn't have a chance. I'd already beat you because I saw it a long time ago. And you can see it. Look how big that is out there. Look how much. Look how much is sucking out there. That's all bait being pulled out. Oh yeah. So actually, he in the wrong place to be swimming. Yeah. You go That's ahead. what I mean. They always pick that spot to swim. I don't get it. You, you guys do me a favor. You pick right here and then just keep casting here. Let me go down there, okay? <laughs> but earlier, this yeah. was a good spot. Earlier. This was, it was yeah. good early, right? Yeah. Now it's gone. You got to move sometimes just by watching to see what happens. The, sometimes you got to turn your headphones off and start looking at the... The beach is no happened. different than river fishing in a boat. It yeah. really isn't. You don't fish the same spot in a boat all day long. You fish the tide. Same thing here. The beach changes as the tide goes out and it comes in. Outgoing is better on this beach because it's so flat. Some beaches, like Talbot, I, I don't go to Talbot. I learned it a long time ago. I went on high tide a few times and if you're backing up every five minutes, it seems like, and the current can stream through there. The low tide, it's a huge trough. But uh, I love Talbot. Oh, yeah. I was there third. Yeah, did you get any? total about 10. Nice ones? Two. Two, two nice. Ones. Okay. So real quick, uh, each beach is a, you have to start making your chart what bites on which beach. What What is this beach known to, to catch fish on? Sand fleas? Shrimp? Don't clam? Oh, what yeah. How about crabs? Not very prevalent on this beach. I can tell you to fish crab knuckles all day. You throw them here, you might catch a few, but you're gonna go pretty bad. You go to Talbot, mm -hmm. and you cut you, and you go ahead and fish shrimp. Not as common, not as good, because what's up there? Crab, yes. lots of crabs. So each beach has a lot of different structure. Match the hatch. Little, little, yeah, match the hatch. Little Talbot doesn't have a lot of uh, the coquina clams. All here we have them, okay. Can you catch with clams up there? Yes. Bernadina, you better take shrimp and you better take yeah. clams. You take crabs, guess what? You're out of luck. Now, it's just around the corner from Talbot, but that's just how it works. So know what beach to, to take your take your bait, uh, what you're going to fish. So there are, and what always eats? What does every fish eat? Shrimp. Anybody fish braid? <laughs> Often for casting cannon. <laughs> Works well. Piece of shiny. leather. Shiny. Little spongy. What, what else can be used? Electrical <laughs> tape or a little tire. You have a kid's bike or a, a little 26 inch tire um, bike. Got a bad tube. Cut it and it'll make it cut the end off just like this. Whoop. So you can get your finger in it. If you can't get any of that, waterproof band-aids. Put two of them on, last maybe an hour, hour and a half. Then you put two more on. Make so sure your fingers dry when you put them on. It'll stop you from getting the split finger. Yeah. All right, all right here. Yeah, right here. So all this foam right here? That's all sandbar. That's all sandbar. Yep. Wherever you see the nice non-foam, that's where it's deep. So put one rod on the sandbar and one rod in the deep and figure out where the fish are sitting at that time. Okay. The most important thing I learned from these guys is not, I don't need to cling it. It's, I got to put it in the right spot. That's more yeah. important. Yeah, it's not about th how far you can throw, it's, it's about like catching them. Ca coming and catching the fish because the more fish, you, it's not always about filling the cord, but if you're catching fish, doesn't that make the trip that much more enjoyable? We're spending money on tackle, bait, gas. It's nice to put something in the box because we could just go to a seafood market and spend a lot less money and buy some fish there, but we all love the fish. So when we learn how to target the fish, it makes it that much more enjoyable. We all love to catch. Yep. There's a, <laughs> past, there's a huge, the sandbar down there is even bigger. Where those three guys are, to the north of them, there's a massive like fish. I like catching so If I came on this beach right now, I got four or five options of where I'd want to fish immediately. In this area. Yeah, in this area. Yeah, one area.